it makes sense for me to also bring in a little bit of context as well. And I don't want to bore you, but somehow it also has a bit of a relationship with how I've worked and where I've worked in the last 10 years. Because for me, it's sort of all of those relationships sort of build up and, and cross over. And um, when I have to sort of really think about what it is that I do, I think um, it's quite a simple explanation, really, is that I, I work with artists and I work with artists to try and um, generate new context for them and also for um, making new work. Um, I started off at the Irish Museum of Modern Art um, over 10 years ago doing major um, exhibitions, including um, uh, solo retrospectives with the Polish artist Marissa Bauta, um, you know, Claudio Keith, and Alex Camp. Um, but I also worked with a French artist called Philippe Bueno, who is sort of probably most famous for making his film about the gang. And Philippe worked with us when we curated, um, we curated a big group exhibition. And also, um, I was always, when I was at Emma, working to find these spaces that sort of fell in slightly outside of the traditional gallery space. Um, there was also, um, Irish Museum of Modern Art was also set up by Declan McGonagall, who was a, a sort of such an important curator at the time. Like many people, he ended up actually being fired. Um, but he was also one of the only curators that was put up as, sort of, as an artist to win the Turner Prize. And when he set up the Irish Museum of Modern Art, he wanted it to be a living museum as well. So, um, which um, is easy sort of now to reference back to one of the first curators, which is Alexander Dorno who wrote a book called The Living Museum. But we had artists in residence um, normally for six to three months as well. And when those artists in residence came to Dublin, they had a process room within the museum where they could also have complete freedom in what they wanted to exhibit or perform or, or make in that space. And it was, you know, in, in the galleries, so it wasn't sort of, it wasn't considered um, sort of lower down in the hierarchy of the system. And also when the artists came to Dublin, we would help them sort of integrate more into the system in the city. So that was also um, connecting them to artists, teaching, doing performances, and also education workshops. Um, and that sort of pulled me a little bit towards um, my work at the Sunderson Gallery, where I was also um, the senior creator of public programmes, which included commissioning all the new performances and films. And I worked across all the different departments as well, including the exhibition. But we also had a major project that went on for four to five years. And it's still going on called the Edra Road Project, which took the Edra Road as a site. And we had a number of locations, which went from, I think we started off with an old hairdresser. We had an old Indian restaurant at one point, and actually quite a glamorous, sort of semi-derelict manor house at the end. And, um, that project, I'm not going to, I could talk about in great detail. Janet Graham, who's now the um, head of public programs at Nottingham Contemporary, really was sort of spearheading that. But we had a centre for possible studies. Um, it was very relaxed and informal. Artists from around the world came with residencies, set up bands, PURK bands, then travelled around the world. And so it was always about trying to find these different sites in order to work with artists in different ways. And also, most of the work there was also about how to work outside of the, the exhibition space and um, how we could find, or well, work with artists to find cracks in the system and um, generate different types of practices that could include the public in the processes as well. So when I came a couple of years ago to the office um, a position at, at Freeze running their not-for-profit, um, art commissioning project, um, I was sort of trying to bring all of these experiences and ideas and systems of working with artists to think about how we could generate new work that would be interesting, <coughs> um, both for the artists and also the participants. Um, and then the first year, um, So the first year I worked with an artist, Finnish artist called Pilvi, 
Takawa. Mm. And she's um, also partner of Anna Elbert, who has the show on at the Tiffany Gallery at the moment, and also set up the Silent University, which is also part of the Tate um, pedagogical program, and it's also traveled around the world, which is also a very interesting project if you're interested in sort of radical spaces of pedagogy. Um, Sylvia actually won the Artist Award in 2013, which is an open call, which artists can apply for from all the way around the world. And at the time, as part of that award, you also um, were uh, awarded a residency in London for sort of three months in the build-up to, the, fa to the, the October Fair. And um, Sylvie's proposal was that she wanted to um, give the money, which was um, £10,000, um, and the idea with that was that the money was meant to be spent on the the production cost of a new piece of work by an individual artist. So also just trying to think about how we can break down these hierarchies of sort of thinking about the unique objects in a gallery space and also where, where the artwork is actually in this process, which is something that we're still sort of thinking about and talking about. But in many ways, what Philby thought about was the gesture was to give this money to a group of people who could then decide what they wanted to do with the money. Obviously, that was a much more complicated process, and um, Philby's is hugely articulate and has also worked in many different public spaces with different groups of people over a number of years. And, um, and she wanted to sort of think about these questions about what it, you know, the ethical questions and who to give the money to. Um, she decided that what she wanted to do was to work with a small group um, based in London, and we, after sort of having some sort of informal meeting, we, we met a group um, in Bo, a community centre, and um, she decided to give the money to a group of um, young people, probably with, within the age range of, sort of 9 to 12. And it was also quite an informal community set up, so there wasn't sort of too many established sort of like processes, systems or hierarchies. And then after working with this group um, over a, a period of four months, um, they, as a group, collectively made proposals for what they wanted to, the money to be spent on. Mm. And I won't go through all of the ideas, but um, they decided that what they wanted to do was to start a business so that they could also generate sort of economy um, for them to also be able to support their informal gatherings and also um, support the, commu the local community. And so what happened was with the project that was meant to be presented at the fair in October, actually nothing was really presented, um, but they used it as an opportunity to announce their idea, which also, because Breathe is also a platform, you know, also was able to then have a full page spread article in the Financial Times and sort of managed to sort of reach out on multiple different um, news platforms. And, um, and so they, and then they generated a flyer, which um, was passed out at the art fair. And they also had a committee room where they could sort of discuss their ideas to, to make a bouncy house, which they then would hire. Um, this was designed by the group. It also took another year for us to um, finish the designs and also go into production. Um, it has, as you can see, it has a sofa, a television, which is very important, a wardrobe and a toilet, um, and a slide. Um, and so then when, when this was finished, um, the house was really, when it came off the, out of the factory, it went straight to um, the community centre where the, the children are based and they are now in full control of, of what happens and where, where this um, where this is also then you know they're, they're who they hire the bouncy house to and what what they also charge for the hire um, it has gone to uh, biennial in Wren um, where they generated quite a uh, they sort of generated quite a sort of interesting amount of money, and um, and now they've decided that they don't really want to hire it up for any more art organisations. But 
Um, also, um, I worked with an Australian artist in 2013 as well called, called Jerry Bibby. Um, and Jerry Bibby used to work at Breeze um, as um, in, uh, one of the guys that installed the large tents that we have in Regent's Park. And he was always fascinated by the, the fact that um, when you dig into the soil in Regent's Park, it's actually full of oyster shells. And so it was also like a particular history to the social context of what the oyster means in the history of London. Um, and sort of just to sort of play with these kind of social hierarchies that are also established within the context of an art fair. Um, Jerry um, brought an oyster meister um, to the install of um, the tents and also adds oysters a great protein for your lunch. We were, this is also something that was never shown as well. I shouldn't really be showing this documentation because it wasn't about fetishizing um, what, what happened prior to the fair. And then at the fair, um, the, the oyster shells were sort of then generated into um, a sculpture by Gary Bibby. And also there were these moments of um, action throughout the fair and also discussion about the kind of social history and context of the oyster. Um, again, a relatively invisible project, which might maybe be a bit problematic as well from other pe people's points of view. Um, and so this brings me back to sort of maybe more recent proposals. and. Um, I just wanted to also just slightly take a detour as well to the graphic art biennial that I'm curating in Ljubljana um, this year because I think actually I'm not going to talk about it today partly because the press needs to put out and I haven't um, finalised all the projects but um, I think also Ljubljana is a really important site for um, artworks that also engage with the city particularly in the 80s and 90s and there's a big retrospective, just in case anyone is sort of interested in sort of, because um, there's also um, an artist from the former Yugoslavia in the exhibition upstairs. Um, the NSK, which is also made up of Urban, the Artist Collective, um, New Design Collective, and also Liveback, the punk um, band who have collaborated with Michael Clark in different, um, and all different events with the performance of the tape. But, um, they have a major retrospective um, happening in Ljubljana at the Modern Art Gallery at the moment. But um, I, it's sort of linked to Braco Dimitrovic, who is an artist from Croatia. This is a piece that he did photographing. It's, called, it's part of his casual passers-by series that he has been doing for probably the last 20, 30 years. <coughs> One of the images that was presented on the front of Pompey Center many years ago. But um, this is a reference that's building up to your project that I did with Carrickman Evans at London Zoo last year, and um, which referred to a project that Bracco had done in Paris in the 90s, where he'd managed to borrow there were two, two exhibitions, actually. The first was pieces of work that he'd made when he was young, and the second was him borrowing um, works from the Louvre and exhibiting them in Paris Zoo, in, in the lion cages, in the animal cages. And, um, and he's also worked with animals in a number of different locations. And, um, and also another reference um, is here, which is also a pauper artist called Gino De De Dominicus. And um, Gino also was quite famous for staging an exhibition just for animals. So um, we still, there are obviously no documentation of it. Um, and so when Karis and I sort of started to talk about what it would mean, um, so Karis is also an artist um, in his sort of mid-career, he's in his 50s, and he's a Welsh artist, and he, when he moved to London in the 70s, we were talking about one of the first places he visited was actually London Zoo, and how it was a very important place for him, to sort of also being able to observe people from a distance, sort of looking and observing, in, in, in what he would consider a very similar way to how people operate um, in art museums. And, um, and London Zoo is also an important site if, for a number of reasons. I mean, it's the first scientific zoo 
in the world. It was, I think it was also the second public zoo after Paris Zoo. And also they're very much sort of um, involved in um, campaigns against um, the extinction of animals and also ecological uh, um, problems in the world. So we also, but then it's also a site of a modernism and it's a site where it was the first place in London where all the modernist buildings were commissioned. So most of you also know the famous Penguin Pool, which was, um, and which was by the um, architect Lebetkin, who also did the roundhouse, the gorilla house. Um, and also, it's, it's interesting, this is sort of also a bit of a loop back to Alexander Dorner's Living Museum, that this is the Snowden Avery, which is also very much on a public site in the zoo, because you normally have to pay to have access. And um, this is on Regent's Canal. Um, and it was designed by Cedric Price, um, with, um, you know, collaboratively with um, Lord Snowden. And it was also a system based on Buckmonster Fuller's um, design for the Living Museum as well. And um, it was only ever meant to be up for 25 years, so, but obviously now all these buildings are listed, and it also needs desperate repairs. Um, it's actually, uh, the outside of it is hand woven aluminium, so it's actually but incredibly beautifully crafted. And with Keris, we were deciding about what it would mean to present a work within, within the London Zoo, and also a way of doing something that would sort of highlight the work that they're doing, without being sort of too obvious, or to have something that was sort of poetic, um, but didn't have to sort of make a statement about extinction or of any of their kind of uh, current campaigns. Um, so we decided that Carrie wanted to take um, sort of a misremembered line from the James Merrill poem, uh, which also sort of had a theatricality, and that we would um, install it um, across the canal, um, up to the top of the Avery, and it, in some ways, for Caracas was kind of a kind of call to flight. Um, and sorry, I haven't actually got that much. So um, this is us rigging and installing, um, and then this is the piece after it was installed, and it was up for three weeks and. Also, it was a way for us at Freeze to reach a completely different audience that wouldn't normally come to the art fair. And I think we were also interested in the fact that some people would just come across it because they're running down the canal, while others were just wanting to go to the zoo. And um, what it says, so I came to know what the Japanese puppets taught us, namely what it means to be moved. Um, and also we organized a performance that happened um, on this boat during, during the opening of Freeze, which was just um, a flutist playing um, a specific um, piece of music. Um, so it was also this kind of very quiet and meditative still moment as well, um, during a week when everyone is sort of very busy and, and running around. And then I just have one more project with, to show you as well, which is, um, I think in the context of an art fair, it's not a very easy situation to also be thinking about how to commission new works for a not-for-profit organization. And obviously everyone is very aware of all those kind of contradictions that are embedded in these situations. But I think, for, for me, it's also very much about how um, I can sort of enable artists to focus on things that maybe aren't necessarily the idea of these kind of finished, unique objects sort of within a gallery space, or things that have a certain commerce. And, um, and so a lot of performance um, is always sort of, I think now everyone's, now it's been sort of um, brought into many of the museums and also performer in New York it's interesting to think about how performance in itself is sort of established to sort of break down many of those hierarchies and sort of myths that surround this idea of the artist making work in, in isolation. So again, um, it's not completely related because it's not obviously um, outside in the streets, um, 
but I, we last year presented a number of dance performances. We brought the Disabled Theatre by Jerome Bell, a famous French choreographer to London. And we also commissioned new work by a choreographer called Anna Linda. Um, Isabel Lewis also did a performance in, uh, um, off-site in a derelict department store in central London um, with the ICA. And um, we decided to commission a ballet, um, which was sort of incredible. It was also still quite unfashionable at the time to be thinking about bringing ballet into the context of the fair. And um, also many of the things that I've been doing as well is sort of also trying to establish relationships with other organizations around the country and also internationally. So um, we, we worked with the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis as they have the Merce Cunningham archive, which is incredible because they have all of the costumes and even the makeup stubs that he, from um, all of the performances that he did. Um, we worked also with the Northern Ballet in Leeds um, and collaborated with them as they have uh, many fantastic dancers that are also on staff. So the collaboration um, was that they were able to pay the salaries for the dancers and so while they were able to work with us on a new piece. Um, and also we, you know, for example, then also included um, London Zoo and Liverpool Biennial and a number of organisations. So um, the ballet also was like referring to Douglas Crimp. Has, there's a fantastic lecture, I think, at, at L.A. Mocha by Douglas Crimp, who's a famous art historian in America, who talks about his own sort of ballet mania and, um, and talks about the history of dance in museums. I think most people sort of trying to find fa um, sort of a complete understanding if it is an accurate history, but um, he was very much talking about why dance has sort of come to sort of be appearing in galleries, spaces, as well as out, out in the streets and also in the um, context of the theatre. So for Jerome Bell, who's the French choreographer, he's very much someone who only really wants to work with the notion of the stage and um, in the context of a traditional sort of proscenium arch. But uh, the, the very early, sort of the first pieces of dance that came to the museum, I think the first one was Meredith Monk, who is um, an important experimental musician, choreographer, who also did freeze music in 2013. She did a piece in 1979 at the Guggenheim in New York. And also Helly Otisika as a kind of action, again, pro not necessarily a protest, but at the opening of the Sao Paulo Museum of Contemporary Art, he um, arranged a mass performance that took over the building of um, carnival, um, sort of carnival dancers. And then, um, then there's also Merce Cunningham, who again links back to the Walker Centre. And Merce Cunningham was on tour in, in Europe, and he was asked to do a performance again in the late 60s at the um, Museum of the 20th Century in Vienna. And Douglas Crimp also very much talks about the problems of, of architecture in these moments because, um, not to go back to sort of the Cedric Price and the Living Museum, but how a lot of, in the 19th century, a lot of art institutions were built very much also on the hierarchy that um, the disciplines were separated. So you had museums and galleries for paintings and sculptures, but then, you know, performance and theatre was meant to be off site in, in a theatre space. Um, but with Merce Cunningham, there's a sort of economics also when you run a dance company that you have dancers that also need to eat and perform, possibly sort of support families at home. So when they got around to Vienna on their tour, they were um, in a situation where there was no stage, there was no proscenium arch. And so they had to adapt the piece um, and bring it into the gallery space. And this is something that was also sort of an accident in many ways. Um, and so, but we were also interested in these ideas of, of ballet roots as well, how um, the history of ballet also in, in that specific context, which also involved artists such as Picasso and Matisse, but it was also a system that was trying to rethink ballet in a non-hierarchical sense. So it wasn't so much about, I mean there were prima ballerinas, but it was also much more about how 
artists and theatre directors, musicians and um, set designers could all collaborate on an equal footing. Um, and then that also is much more exaggerated in the history of um, Merce Cunningham and also his relationship with the filmmaker Charles Atlas, who also came to Freeze to do the talk. So what, the way we try and work is also to sort of establish spaces for discussion as well as spaces for the presentation of new work. And um, we designed a set within the fair, which was, um, so Freeze is also an unusual setting, I guess, in terms of this idea of the relationship between traditional gallery spaces, um, work that happens off-site um, in the pedagogical program as well as in the performance program. But with and at the Serpentine Gallery, you often have exhibitions that are up for six weeks, and then you would have a um, performance that maybe would happen for one or maybe two nights. Um, with Freeze, it's very much um, important that the work sort of has and is activated over a more of a festival fair here, isn't it? To go back to what Ben was saying earlier about this idea of the fair as a, as a space for people to, to collect and um, congregate. And, um, and so it was also this way of like thinking about what it meant to present something in the context of the fair. So the ballet was really also based around these ideas of um, an ongoing rehearsal, you know, almost a proposition for something that Nick may well make. I apologise it's Whitney um, in the future. But um, it also was a way for us to also look at the visitors and the public of the fair as well in, in a different way to sort of move the camera around. Um, so in the morning there was um, a, a choreographer called Lorena Randy who was um, organising ballet class and also presenting um, a moment with the younger boys that you saw meeting earlier. The, there was a process of the dancers warming up and getting dressed and having their makeup, and um, and then there were moments when um, the performance became much more sort of complete in some senses. Um, Kim Gordon was also playing new music that she'd constructed, um, and um, I, don't, I guess well, I'm presuming you guys know who Kim Gordon is, obviously from Sonic Youth. And, um, and also another musician called Juliana Huxtable. And then the final thing was other collaborations on the set design and also on the uh, costumes. It's, it's, sort of, it's just a three minute film, which you might let you watch.
over that, you know, over that length of period and slightly beyond through that relationship. Right. All right, cool. Um, and then the, I picked up on a couple of things that you said. One was, um, where it um, uh, you, you, you talked about the contradiction in terms of your working for a not-profit, um, mm -hmm. probably in relation to the, I, my perception of the Freeze Art Fair being kind of um, a huge money spinner. Um, and then also, um, uh, you mentioned, uh, I forget the other, oh sorry, I forget the other one mentioned. Um, but I, you come across quite apolitically, or you, I felt, um, and probably because it follows uh, quite a political. Um, really the question is, how do you remain apolitical, or why do you? Um, I am interested in generating platforms, and then the different work to be able to speak for themselves within that and give a, give a platform for the artist. I'm not apolitical within that. I think it's just a different way of thinking about where those subtleties lie, and often in the context of freeze, those subtleties are, subtleties are quite embedded within the work and aren't sort of on a sort of surface um, presentation. Right? But I don't think freeze is necessarily the space. I think maybe my show in Ljubljana has a whole different kind of politics to it that I'm not talking about today. So this is only one part of what I do. Okay, thanks. Questions, we might go and have some lunch perhaps. Um, but I want to say thank you very much to Nicola. Um, <laughs>